so many churches today. I'm not going to say that they don't have the spirit operating in their churches because some of them very well do. But giving God a certain amount of time to have his way and simply letting him have his way is two different things. Many times when we come to service, it's this is our plan. And if God wants to show up, that's okay. There's no plan B. It's only plan A when we come together. It's what does God want to do? If God doesn't want to do anything, then we're not going to do anything. Amen. If God wants us to pray, then we're going to pray. If God wants to use more than one speaker, we're going to use more than one speaker. If God wants to use someone to prophesy as he did this morning, we're going to allow them to prophesy. God didn't call us to pencil him into our schedules. He calls us to allow him to be our schedule. How many of you understand God's always on time? How many of you understand God always knows what he's doing? That's why when we come together to have service, we don't get together and read off a list and say, here's what we do. We sing this song here. After that second song, brother such and such comes up. Here's where we take offering. Here, we... No. The reason why is because the scripture never gives us a guideline to have service like that. So if scripture didn't give us a guideline to have service like that, where did it come from? The carnal mind. Because the carnal mind can read a verse and get a limited amount of knowledge from it. For example, 1 Corinthians 14, which tells us, let everything be done decently and in order. And 1 Corinthians 14 gives us a whole detail of how to be in order according to the leading of the spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 doesn't tell us, okay, Write out your whole order of service and stick to this because this is the will of God. First Corinthians gives us an order of operating in the spirit. Here's how prophecy should operate. Here's how tongues and interpretation should operate. Here's how teaching should operate. Whoever has a doctrine, let them teach. Amen. That's why when you come together, it's usually more than one speaker. Why? Because that's how it was in scripture. So we do things differently around here, but it's not because there's no order. It's because we desire to let God have his way from the minute we pray to the songs we sing to what we preach. We're seeking God constantly to have your way. God have your way in us today. Use whoever you want to use. The church isn't about just one person. The church is about the body edifying itself. And when we come together, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for God to. To bring one piece of the puzzle through one person. Then another piece of the puzzle through another person. Then when we all come together, we understand. We see the totality of what God wanted to do. God doesn't just use one person all the time. That's why Jesus sent them out two by two. Because God never intended just one person to have the glory. When it's more than one person coming together in union, in the unity of the spirit, no one person gets credit. The only one that gets credit is the author. And that's God. And that's what church should be about, giving God the glory. Amen? So as we come together, as we've sought God already and we're seeking him to continue to lead us, would you bind together with me one more time and just pray that whatever God wants to do, however he wants to say it, let's pray that God will speak to his people today. Hallelujah, Father. We come before you with thanksgiving. We come before you with praise. We thank you for your spirit today, God. We lean not to our own understanding, God. We're not going to lean to my understanding of what I think church should be like. But I lean to your understanding, the leading of your spirit, God, as we seek you, Father. For if you don't speak to us, we have no direction. If you don't lead us, there is no leading. If you don't give us a commandment, we have nothing to follow, God. We lean not upon our own understanding, but we lean upon your spirit. And we call unto you in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, your son. And we pray that you lead us, God, from this point forward. Continue to lead us by your spirit. Continue to lead us by your anointing, God. We seek you for your anointing to dwell among us, God. For we truly have no desire for any man to teach us. But the anointing, the unction, which is of you, that's what we seek to teach us. So give us an ear to hear what your spirit is saying to the church. 
Let everything that go forth Go forth under your authority, God. Let everything that go forth, go forth under your anointing. May everything that go forth, go forth under the authority of the Spirit, Father. For truly no flesh shall glory, God. No flesh shall glory in your presence. Continue to lead us today as we seek you for your will. Your perfect will. Which is from above, God. We seek you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Hallelujah. If if you've received the word, if you believe that God's going to continue to lead us by your spirit, would you just give God a hand clap of praise and appreciation right now in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. We sincerely thank God for all that has been done thus far. Truly grateful. To be here in this body of um, believers today to receive and to seek after truth that what he may have for us. Amen. I thank God for that which happened so far, what we have done thus far. Thank God for everything. I do have this word of encouragement, word of exaltation uh, coming from Isaiah 51. I believe that's the entire chapter. And we're going to start with verse one all the way down. How's everybody feeling today? Amen. Amen. Despite of it all, you guys are still blessed. We are truly grateful. We are truly grateful for all the things that God has given unto us. He's given us the mind through Christ Jesus to have that walk that we may come into the fullness and the statue of the measure of of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm truly grateful for that. I'm truly grateful to be around you guys one more time. If, while I was praying, the words rise to courage came heavily to me rise to courage and we sincerely thank God for the word that has come forth today a few seconds before that that was the words that came to my spirit rise to courage telling us to rise no matter what what may come rise here is the word of God through the prophet Isaiah and these were the words it says "Hearken to me ye that follow After righteousness. Listen to me. He that seek the Lord. I want you to look. Unto the rock. Whence ye. Whence ye are hewed. Or cut out. And to the hole. Of the pit. Whence ye are digged. He said look to the rock. And we know. And everyone know. Now that that rock. Is. That rock is. Christ. And he also says, now look to the second. He said, look unto Abraham, your father. And unto Sarah that bear you. Speaking here to the nation of Israel. Just wanted to give context here. So he's encouraging them, telling them to pay attention to the rock. First, that's what he, that's what he said in the first verse. Then he said, look unto Abraham, which is considered the father of the Hebrew. Look unto the mother of where you came from. He said, for I what? I called him alone, Abraham. He called him alone and blessed him and increased him. He said, I want you to pay attention. Next verse. He said, for the Lord shall comfort Zion. He is going to comfort his people. He will comfort all her waste places. Waste places, he is going to comfort everything that seems bad. Everything that did not work out. The waste places. I'm going to comfort it. And he will make her, the wilderness, her dry areas, her dry places is going to be like Eden. 
It's going to be fr- There you go, Elder. It's going to be fruitful. And her desert light, her desert place, be like the garden of the Lord. Not only that, joy and glad, joy, remember that? Joy and gladness shall be found therein. When we are connected. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. When the, let me keep reading. Hearken unto me, listen to me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me. And I will make my judgment to rest for a light to the people. That law which we have, the spirit, the law of Christ, is in us. That light we shine when we walk in that perfection. Doesn't necessarily mean that we won't go through. We, they're going through. He said that law that proceed from me. And I will make my judgment, my justice to rest. And this, this in us will be a light to the nation. Next verse. He said, my righteousness is near. My salvation going forth. And my arms shall judge the people. The owls shall wait upon me. And on my arms shall they trust. On my authority. On my power. Those that, that, that trust in God, they will trust in his laws and his ways, no matter what it is. He said, trust in all of it. We find comfort when we follow and be led by the Spirit. Next verse. Lift up your eyes to the heaven and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness, my righteousness shall not be abolished. Next verse. Let me, let me, let me go down. Let me keep reading. Hearken unto me. How many times have we saying this? He's keep telling, listen to me. Listen to me. Pay attention to what I'm saying. I know the situation you're in right now. I know what kind of state you may be in. He said, listen to what I'm saying. Despite of what you're facing, listen to what I'm saying. Ye that know righteousness, know intimately righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. He said, fear ye not the reproach of men. Neither be ye afraid of their revilings or reverence. Why? For the moth shall eat them up like a garment. And the worm, he's telling us, like he tell the nation of Israel. I say, I know what kind of state you're in, but if you know righteousness, you know my law, you know where you come from, stay In the path of where I tell you to walk in. You might be going through. But if you have enough faith to abide in my righteousness. Everything's going to be all right. Every single thing is going to be all right. And the worm shall eat them like a wool. But my righteousness shall be forever. And my salvation is going to be from generation to generation. Hmm. Awake, awake, put on strength. Hmm. Hmm. O arm of the Lord. Awake as ye as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that had cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Now he's reminding them their history, what I have worked in them, 
And sometimes he's telling us, be reminded of the things of past that what I've done through you. And remember the goodness and the grace and the righteousness that I've wrought through you before. Art thou not it which had dried the sea? Now God is telling them, aren't you the one that dried the sea? When the fact is, he's the one that actually did the work. So the nation of Israel walked on dry ground. He said, aren't you the one that actually fought, see my work, walked on dry ground, crossed the Red Sea? You've seen my manifestation. you see in the past. Why don't you go back and recollect some of the things that I've done before? Because if I could do that for you then, then I can do that for you and more now. Rise. To courage. Let me read it again. Art thou not it which had dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that had made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? He did that for them. Next verse. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head they shall obtain gladness and joy how are they going to obtain it as long remember the word of the Lord Wednesday before we could get to gladness and joy what we have to go through y'all remember before we can get here, we must go through. And if you suffer with Christ, that's what the Bible says, that we should also reign with Christ. But we must go through the process of testing where our faith and our allegiance lies. Before we can get, and you see, see, listen. They, they shall, it's, once again, remember, we, we, I believe it was, I don't know, remember who said it, but shall is future, future tense. That means if we continue, we will obtain gladness and joy. As long as you stick with his word, we're going to obtain it. May not right now, but you stay focused. As was spoken, you all remember Wednesday night? General said, weeping, when he read Psalms, uh, it was it 30? Weeping may endure for a night, and our night may not be a 12-hour zone. It could be for a while, but joy cometh in the morning. This gladness is something that we obtain once we have been redeemed. And what? Look at this. And sorrow and mourning shall what? flee. Next verse. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? What are you afraid of? Rise to courage. And of, the, and, and of the son of men which shall be made as grass. And forget us the Lord thy maker that has strength, or strengthened forth the heavens, or stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day because of the fury, uh, because of the fury of the oppressors. And if as if he were ready to destroy. So let me read this again. Because it's put in 12 and 13 together. Two questions. And forget us the Lord. You forget us the Lord. Thy maker. Excuse my uh, Jamaican uh, accent. That had stretched forth the heavens. And laid the foundations of the earth. And has feared continually every day. Because of the fury of the oppressors. As if he were ready to destroy. And were 
And where is the fury of the oppressors? In other words, why are we being afraid of man that can only destroy the body? We are in a place, if, as long as we continue, we fear not no man. But we fear and to seek to please him that can kill both body and soul in hell. That's who we should fear. Not what man can do unto us. Next verse. The captive exiled hasteth that he may be loosed and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. Next verse. But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose wave roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, thou art my people. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou has drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. I'm going to explain that. Keep going. There is none to guide her among all the sons whom she had brought forth. Neither is there any that taken her by the hand of all the sons that she had brought up. These two things are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction, and the famine and the sword, by whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets, as a wild bull in net in a net, they are full of the fury of the Lord, they, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus said the, thy Lord, the Lord, and thy God that pleaded the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. So therefore that which they had and destruction and stuff that will follow with a few verses. He said, I'm going to take it away from you. Keep reading. Uh, keep Next verse. He said, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee. In other words, when we, have, when, when we go through, when we stand on the word of God, we may, incur some, we may incur some afflictions. We may incur some burdens that we may have to carry. But he's saying that I, I, if you continue in my righteousness, I will remove this thing. Because, why? Because when we abide in the righteousness and be led by the Spirit, I will remove it. And those that oppress you, I will, tra I will do a transferal. I will do a transferal in your life. In other words, I will, if you abide in me, then I will get what? Take, you remember what Christ says? He said, if, 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 if uh, take of me and learn, because you know that my burden is what? easy and my, my, my light my yoke is easy I should say and my burden is light it's a transfer once we learn of Christ the ways of God this is the same promise here he said afflict thee which have let me read it again but I will put it into the hands of them that afflict thee which have said to thy soul bow down that we may go over and thou hast laid thy body as to the, as the ground and as the street to them that went over. Is that it? That's it. In other words, all this from the last previous verse, he has called us to courage to rise up because remember the words and the promises that he has given. And that he's saying, even with the word of the Lord saying, I love you because I have you in my hands.
He's saying that even though we may go through, even though we are going to have it, these things will come and shall come. But one thing, one thing should be always consistent is that no matter how hard it gets, we stand firm on that word of God, knowing that there will be a transfer. Rise to that courage and stand on that and that being led no matter what, because after a while, them that cause us to bow down is going to be a transfer where they have to bow down. And we may happen to walk on top and tread upon every scorpion, everything in this world. Because righteousness shall rise. Holiness will rise. There's a standard of righteousness that's going to be. As, as it is said before, it seemed like we're losing. It seemed like things are not working. Stay focused. Stay encouraged in God. Continue praying. Continue fasting. Continue seeking him. Continue to walk in righteousness. And he will exalt us in due time. And that is the power that we have to trust in his word. Rise to the courage. We have that courage. If we pay our part, God will do his. Amen. So I just want you guys to just to meditate on that. To think about it. To know that no matter what. He said, go back and reflect to what I've done for you in the past. Look back when you should have been dead. Look back when you know the answer was no. And I've made a way. Look back on when the doors were closed in your face and somehow a door was open. Look back on how you know from the thoughts of your conscience, your intuition, you know. But yet that grace, that same power is working and shall work marvelously in our lives. Meditate on these things. Amen. The verse that sticks out most there is, why do you fear a man that shall die? Why are we worried about what any man on this earth believe, thinks of us? And we allow them to pressure us into compromising God's word. That's foolish. Why would I ever be afraid of a man that's going to die? Versus a God who cannot die. I will please God as for, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. That's beautiful. Very encouraging. I, um, all this week was drawn to, for me personally, um, as the spirit was ministering to me concerning, um, the gospel of John chapters, number 14, 15, and 16 and 17. These four chapters were on my mind. I read them numerous times. This particular week. And I encourage you, if you feel impressed um, this week, continue to read those verses. It's amazing the principles and the prophecies that Christ speaks to his followers. It's amazing what Jesus says in those in those four chapters. However, this morning I feel um, I want to publicly read to you John chapter 17. Um For years, I would read John 17 and never could enjoy it. And the reason why is because I had an incorrect understanding of who Christ was. And what I believed about Christ just didn't line up with John 17. So the only time I read it is when... I was in a Godhead discussion with someone who opposed my view and they bought it, brought it up. But this week I sat down and I began to read this now that the spirit of truth has led me to truly understand who Christ is. I began to read that this week and was so blessed by the words of Christ in John 17. And I want to share that blessing with you this morning. Uh, John chapter number 17, verse number 1. After Jesus has been teaching his disciples, 
just tremendous commandments, prophecies, revelations, mysteries in, in 14, 15, and 16. After Jesus spake those words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, he's praying. Jesus is praying. Who's he praying to? His father. And he says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son. Not thyself. Glorify thy son. That thy son also may glorify thee. In other words, because of what you're going to allow to happen to me, my death, my burial, my resurrection is going to glorify you. As thou hast given him, he's speaking of himself in third person here, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, so God gave Christ all power or power over all flesh. Matthew 28 says, gave him all power. And Jesus is referring to that now. As thou hast given him, Christ, power. Over all flesh. That he, Christ, should give eternal life. To as many as you, God, have given him, Christ. God gave, stay on that verse. God gave Christ power over all flesh that Christ should give eternal life to as many as God has given to Christ. He explains this in detail later down. Now this is his prayer. This is God and Christ communicating. Christ praying to his God. As he says three chapters later, I'm ascending to my God and my Father's, what he told Mary. I'm ascending to my God and my Father. Now he's praying to his God and his Father in chapter 17. And this is eternal life, Christ prays, that they might know you. It, listen, King James, we're reading this King James English, thee. Thee means nothing to us. We don't speak like this. You don't run around saying, thee, go to the grocery store. That, yeah, thou. I can't even get the right forms right. I don't speak this. This is not... There, th listen, there's British English, and then there's American English. And then somewhere over here hanging off the side is Southern American English. <laughs> so this is British English. And not only is this British English... This is 16th century British English. So when we read 16th century British English, it doesn't mean as much to us. But if you read in American English, if you read, and this is eternal life, that they might know you, Christ, speaking to God as not me, but you. That's a completely different dynamic. That they may know you and Christ calls his father the only true God. And now he speaks of himself in third person again, which was very common for royalty to do. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's amazing, isn't it? A lot of people don't like it because it contradicts what they believe, but... It's in there. It's the word. Verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I glorified you while I was here. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me. You glorify me with thine own self that we both be glorified. Together with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Christ is praying and, and he is referring to the logos. As John starts out his, the, the gospel, he starts out in the beginning was the word logos, the thought, the plan of God. The word 
the Logos became flesh. So the plan became flesh. Christ, as Peter said, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. So Christ is saying, knowing that he was the plan of God to reconcile humanity, praise, Father, glorify me and glorify yourself with the glory which I had with me in the plan, the logos, before the world was. In other words, God knew before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden that he would have to send Christ to reconcile every sinner back unto himself. So before the world was ever created, God knew he would need a Savior. He would need a man to die for the sins of all the world. That's the glory of Christ is speaking of in this verse. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto... Listen. That name is authority, right? When you understand, Christ said, I have manifested your authority. He just said, you gave me all power. You gave me authority over all flesh. I manifested that authority to them, to the men which you gave me out of the world. In other words, you called men out of the world and gave these men unto me. Talking about the apostles, the believers, all that had believed on Christ. He gets into praying for them. The men which thou gave me out of the world. Thine, they were. They were yours. But you gave them. And they have kept thy word. Seven. Now, they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you. That's why Christ constantly made statements like, the words that I speak are not my own. They're they that, that sent me. I do nothing except what I see the Father do. I speak nothing except what I hear the Father speak. He's saying, they know that what you've given me is yours. You're the source of all this, not me. Verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which you gave to me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from. And they have believed that thou, you sent me. Not you are me. You sent me. It's plain as day. Nine. It's amazing what you see when you take off the blinders of the traditions and and doctrines that men have developed. It's amazing when you begin to read the scriptures that way. Freedom, liberty, spirit of truth, leading you into all truth is what Jesus said just a few chapters previous. I pray for them. I pray for them. Somebody mentioned this, maybe Elder Franco. I prayed for them. I pray not, I'm not praying for those that are in the world. I'm not praying for the sinners. I'm praying for them that you have given to me. No man can come unto Christ except the Father draw him. You you can't even become a follower of Christ except God gives you the understanding that Christ is the Messiah. And he draws you by his spirit to give you that understanding. This is it's so rich. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou, you, have given me. For they are yours. Like, I'm just borrowing them for a little while. You're letting me borrow these people for a little while. And Christ is going to borrow us until... The thousand years of his reign on the earth are are over. And then he will turn 
everything back over to God. And Revelation 1 says that Christ has made us kings and priests unto God. Revelation, what is it, 21 or 22, says that, that God and the Lamb, the new heaven, the new earth come down. God and the Lamb shall be the light thereof. The temple, it needs no temple because God and the Lamb. And then His servants shall serve Him. God's servants. We will, Christ borrowed us for a thousand years. Because of his obedience, his father gave him a kingdom on earth to rule for a thousand years. We reign and rule with Christ. But when that's over, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28, Christ turns all of that and all of us back over to God who gave us to Christ to start with. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are, they're yours. And all mine are yours. Everything I have is yours, God. And everything you have is mine. Because God gave Christ all power. All power. All authority. And all mine are thine, and all thine are mine. And I am glad and I am glorified. So when we live on this earth according to the, the commandments and the teachings of Christ, and we live our lives separate from the world, what are we doing? Glor- glorifying Christ, which is the perfect will of God the Father. Because he has exalted Christ. Made him Lord and Christ. Given him a name which is by uh, above every other name. That at the name, the authority of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But to the glory of who? To the glory of God the Father. It makes The whole Bible makes sense now. The whole Bible. Not any of it. Ugh. It's amazing. I'm glorified in them. 11. And now I am no more in the world. I'm getting ready to leave this world. But these are in the world. And I come to you. Holy Father. Listen, they call the Pope the Holy Father. He ain't no Holy Father. There ain't but one Holy Father. And it ain't the Pope. Jesus said, call no man father upon the earth. For you only have one father. And he's in heaven. He ain't at the Vatican. He's in heaven. That's what Jesus calls his God. Holy Father. Keep them, these that I'm leaving behind in the world, keep them through thine own authority, those whom you have given me that they may be one. How? Just like God and Christ are one, me and you are supposed to be one. That's what he's praying for in his prayer is that there be unity among followers of Christ. That there be no divisions. And people that say that God is Christ. He, Christ is God robed in flesh. They're one in that way. That's impossible. Because Jesus said that you and I are supposed to be one just like him and God are one. That means if Jesus is a literal incarnation of God, that means I've got to be a literal incarnation of Leroy Waldron. But I'm supposed to be one just like God and Christ are one. Which means Christ was in unity. Not that he is God, but he is in unity with God. And I'm supposed to be in unity with you just like God was in unity with Christ and vice versa. Even as we are. He says it again in a a few verses down. While I was with them... In the world. I kept them in thy. 
authority. Those that you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, Judas. That the scripture and the reason he was lost is because it was already prophesied that he would be lost. The scripture, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee and these to you. And these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. It's beautiful. I have given them whose word? God's word. That Christ said, the things I teach are not my own. I don't even speak my own words. I speak the words of God. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they, us, are not of the world. Even as Christ is not of the world. I pray not. This is what I'm not asking you, God. I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world. But that you should keep them from the evil. In other words, I'm not praying you take them out of persecution. I pray that you keep them through persecution. Through all the evil that shall be done unto them. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So people are saying, well, Jesus was not of the world because he was some preexistent God. But he's saying, I'm not of the world in the same way that you're not of the world. I'm not of the world because I was some preexistent God. I'm not of the world because... I'm set apart. I'm a man just like Christ was who was set apart to keep the commandments of God. Sanctify them. Wash them. Purge them. Make them holy. Make them righteous. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. And what was Christ speaking the whole time? The word of God. As Just like you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them. Now, people who are believing that Christ put on a suit of flesh or God put on a suit of flesh and dwelt among us, which the scripture never says, never robed himself in flesh. It's not in there anywhere. But people who believe that have a problem with this verse. Because Jesus said, just like you sent me, I'm sending them. So if God put on flesh and came himself, that means that God also had to literally put us on. And now it's not you who's walking around, it's God who's walking around in your body. Think to yourself, am I a literal incarnation of God? Or am I a man that is filled with the Spirit of God? Very different dynamic. Christ was the same. He was a man filled with the Spirit of God. Even as you have sent me in the world, that's the same way I'm sending them into the world. And for their sakes... For their sakes, I sanctify myself. I'm getting myself right. I'm making sure everything is right with myself for their benefit. Why did Christ need to be sanctified? To teach us how to sanctify ourselves. To be the perfect example of what true sanctification, true holiness, true righteousness really is. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. That they also might be sanctified through... The truth. 
neither pray I for these alone. In other words, I'm not just praying for those that believe on me now. I'm praying for those who are going to believe on me because these preach the word. So I'm not praying for just the 12. I'm not praying for just the 70. I'm not praying for just those in Israel that believe on me right now. I'm praying for them also which shall believe on me through the original's disciples' words. In a nutshell, he's saying right here, I'm not only praying for Peter, James, and John. I'm praying for Leroy Waldron, Annie McLean, Baldo. I'm not only praying for the originals. I'm praying for everybody who will ever believe because of what the originals wrote, preached, handed down, and it's been passing down for 2,000 years. That they... That they all, the originals, us, and everybody in between, that all may be one. How? Just like you, Father, you're in me. Not you are me. You're in me. And I am in you. That they also may be one. Last time I checked, us is plural. That means more than one. That they may be one in us. That the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I gave, passed it on get to the end of John 22 and just start sending the disciples out. Even as my Father has sent me, so send I you. Ah, it's beautiful. The same authority. Uh, I, I, wanna, I don't have time to get into that. That they may be one. How? We, we are one. It's crazy. So we're supposed to be unified in the same way that Christ was unified with God. I in them and thou in me, you in me, that they may be. See, everybody has a problem with the P word. Scared to death. Ain't nobody perfect. No, you're perfect. You're not perfect. And you're trying to justify your own sins by saying nobody can be perfect. But Jesus told us plainly, you can be perfect and without sin. When I say perfect, I don't mean people say, well, I'm not perfect. I forget my keys and I have car wrecks and I do this and I do. That's not per- perfect. is holy, righteous, without sin. That means I, I'm never committing adultery. I might forget my keys, not know where I put them. But I'm not committing adultery. Fornication, lust, greed, pride, all of these things. That they may be perfect in one. That they all may be one. We will never be literally one. Like, you know, I'm not going to. Rub up against him so much that eventually we're one physical body. That's never going to happen. But we will become one in mind, in unity. That's what Paul taught the Corinthians. I pray that you all be of the same mind and same judgment, all speaking the same thing. One in unity. And that's how Christ was one with God. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved. Now, when you read that statement and then you start thinking about how that Paul 
doesn't refer to Jesus as our father. He refers to Jesus as our brother. That Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. And that we are heirs of God, but joint heirs with Christ. Which means we get the inheritance that Christ gets. That's why he tells Mary in chapter 20 verse 17, My God and your God. My Father and your Father. You've loved... He loves us just like he loved Christ. God loves us just like he loved Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then he tells us in the same book that if you believe on the only begotten son, the same that believe on him to them gave Christ power that we may become The sons of God. So Christ is the only begotten son, but we are adopted sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, because of the spirit of adoption. Ah, thou hast loved, you've loved them just like you've loved me. Beautiful. Father, I will that they also, whom you have given me, Be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. God loved Christ before Christ was ever even made. Let this blow your mind. All those scriptures, Colossians, Ephesians, that talk about the world was made by Christ. People think that means Christ made the world. That means God made the world, but he did it thinking of Christ. He created the whole world knowing that Adam and Eve would fall into sin, knowing everything that would happen all throughout the rest of Our existence. God already knew it. And he created everything with Christ in mind. Saying I'm creating all of this. Because there's coming a point. That I'm going to give this entire world. And everything that's in it. To Christ. And Christ shall rule and reign. And have dominion. David saw that dynamic. Psalm 110. And he said Yahweh said unto Adon. Yahweh said unto my Lord, David's Lord. He's speaking of Christ. God, Yahweh said to Christ, sit thou here on my right hand until I make thy enemies your footstool. Which means everybody that won't receive you and rejects you, you just sit right here until my perfect plan is worked out. When it's all said and done, I'm going to give you the whole earth to rule and reign over and then All those that have believed on you shall rule and reign with you because I have loved them just like I have loved you. It's it's beautiful. You love me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, the world has... The world doesn't even know who you are. But... But I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. They believe you sent me. No man has seen God at any time. No man knows God. Nobody's ever seen God at any time. That's the end of 1 John, the epistle. Chapter 4, chapter 5, I can't remember exactly. But the first chapter of 1 John says that even though he says in the end of the book, we've never seen God. No man has seen God at any time. But in the first chapter of the book, he said we have seen the word Jesus. We, We handled it. We touched it. We saw him with our own eyes. We heard him with our own ears. So we saw Christ, but nobody's ever seen God.
So how is that possible if Christ was God? So you have the understanding. The apostles knew Christ was not God. They knew he was the Christ. The, the son of the living God. Isn't that the revelation God gave to Peter? Matthew 16, 15 through 17. Who do you say that I am? Peter, Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Well, some say you're a prophet. But we say, yes, you are the Christ. The son of Of the living God. And then Jesus responds and says. Blessed are you Simon Barjona. You didn't get this revelation from man. You got it from my father. Which is still in heaven. You're looking at me. But God gave you the revelation. Of who I really am. The Christ. The son. Of the living God. And I have declared unto them thy. Name. Authority. And will declare it. He still had a work to do after he prayed this prayer. His life is drawing to a close, but there's still a work to be done. That the the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them and I in them. I pray. Stand with me. I pray that that blesses you as it does me. And I, I, I just, I get mad at times because for years I was robbed of such beautiful passages of John, as John 17 and could not receive the full benefit of what Christ is saying in such passages. That, that right there, that's it. God sent Christ to reconcile us unto himself. It's beautiful. Let's lift our hands and let's thank him for what we've heard this morning. We thank you for your word that empowers us. We thank you, Father, for taking the blinders off of our eyes, the traditions of men that you have stripped away from us. We thank you, Father. From the depths of our spirit, do we thank you for deliverance. And that your spirit of truth has led us into all truth and continues to lead us into all truth. And we will pursue your truth. And we pray as Christ prayed for us that we continue to be sanctified through your word. For your word, Heavenly Father. Your word, Holy Father. Your word is truth. Sanctify these this morning. By truth. And let your love. That was manifest in Christ. Be manifest in us. Also. And we pray these things. In the name. In the authority. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. The authority. Which you yourself gave unto him. That he has given unto us. That we may approach you. Heavenly father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your perfect plan to reconcile us unto yourself because of your great love wherewith you have loved us. We give you praise. Come on, let's praise him right now for the next few minutes. Just from the depths of your heart in sincerity. Let's thank God for what he's done unto us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. When one verse may seem to contradict what you believe, just one verse, it's probably due to a lack of understanding. But when whole chapters contradict what you believe, you need to go back and rethink your doctrine. Amen. When you read entire portions of scripture that don't fit your theology, You need to conform your theology to the scriptures. Amen. And let's not do it the other way around so much. ah, I thank God for what was spoken for the encouragement through Elder Peart today. Amen. Thank God for the all all the word that he spoke. I thank God. John chapter 17. Me and Bishop were speaking the other day that that whole chapter has been on my spirit as of late. I knew it was only a matter of time before somebody went through it. How refreshing is it? 
to, just to know the plan of God, to see the plan of God from beginning to end, how God is utilizing Christ. It's the will of God that we understand his plan. Jesus told us we're, we're his friend. And he said, servants knoweth not what the master doeth. If you don't understand what the master's doing, you're not his friend. It's the will of God that you understand the plan, the blueprints, what God's purpose is from beginning to end. And it's all about Jesus, saints. From beginning to end, it's all about Jesus. The firstborn of every creature, amen? Uh, the key ingredient to our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for us. How many of you feel refreshed today? How many of you feel blessed today? That's how we should feel. Hallelujah. It brings joy to my spirit to know that God loves us enough not to leave us without understanding, not to leave us without truth. We can get it if we want it. Amen. His sheep hear his voice, and I most certainly want to be one of his sheep. Um.